This is Information Service Engineering, lecture number seven, Knowledge Graphs, part two. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about RDF turtle serialization. And as always, all our examples come from climate change and the greenhouse effect in particular this time. So let's remember what we did in the last lecture. We were talking about RDF serialization types. We know that RDF graphs can be serialized, for example, as n triples, where everything is stated as a complete URI, for example. And since these n triples representation, as well as other serialization, like for example, RDF XML, which is an XML style serialization of RDF, soon become rather crowded and it's difficult to, to really understand and read these uh, large knowledge representations, there is a version which is much more abbreviated and aggregated. And this is Turtle, and we are going to talk about Turtle now. OK, but for that, let's have a look back at n triples notation. So in the n triples notation, URIs or IRIs, if you take the international version of URIs, are usually noted down in angle brackets. So that's then a URI, and it's a complete URI. And your literals that you are using are usually given in quotation marks. And to denote that now a triple ended, which means you have subject, property, and object, you end everything with a full stop, a period. Then you know that's over. OK, now let's talk about RDF turtle. Turtle is the abbreviation for terse RDF triple language notation, and this is an extension of n triples. And we see here in the red box exactly the same like before, but as you already see, this is much shorter, which means RDF Turtle allows shortcuts and abbreviations for readability. Again, we start with n triples and we want to make it shorter now. So let's make it shorter. First thing, as you see here, what we can do is we can use prefixes instead of entire URIs. So we are using the prefix of a given URI if it occurs more frequently and we can define a specific prefix for that. So for example, here for DBO or for HTTP dbpia.org slash ontology slash, we define a prefix DBO colon, and then we can write this as a relative URI. We simply then write DBO colon, and then comes the name of the attribute here, discovered or discoverer. And you see, okay, if I want to know what DBO is, I simply look at the prefix definition. In RDF Turtle, prefix definitions usually start with an ampersand prefix, then comes the abbreviation, followed by a colon, and then comes the URI that you want to prefix, given again in angle brackets. And since this is a statement, you have to close it with a full stop. So this is the prefix directive that associates a prefix label with a URI. Next thing what you can do, you could, for example, use a base URI, which means everything which doesn't have, uh, so, so each and every relative URI, which does not have a full URI, so where prefix is missing, gets a standard prefix. That's the base prefix. And for that, you have ampersand base as a keyword, and then you define simply the URI that is always used to extend than any given relative URI. And you see here greenhouse effect, for example, simply the word greenhouse effect in angle brackets. And since we have the base directive, this relative URI is extended to a full URI, to an absolute URI with the help of the base directive. So these are two things already to make things much shorter. Okay, let's further look, what can we do? Um, for example, in our example that we are looking at, we want to write two triples here. We want to say the greenhouse effect has been discovered in 1824 and the greenhouse effect has the discoverer Joseph Fourier. The point is to make it even shorter, we don't have to repeat the subject for these two triples because in both cases it's the same subject. So what I can do here, for example, I can use instead of a period after ending one triple, a semicolon, and this indicates that the subsequent triple has the same subject. This is also referred to as predicate list. So you see here, I can simply write greenhouse effect discovered in 1824. I make a semicolon and then comes the next 
property, which is then DBO Discoverer, Joseph Fourier. Of course, there might also be the case, you know, that for example, like here, you always have the same property and the same subject, but a different, let's say, list of objects. Why here the greenhouse effect, for example, might have as a subject the atmosphere, might have as a subject, then this now is DCT subject, the climate change, or the subject might be atmospheric radiation. And you would have here, as you see in the graph representation, three triples that we can here uh, very good abbreviate it make shorter because always the RDF subject and the RDF property is exactly the same. And we can write this as you see here in the example in the yellow box, greenhouse effect has DCT subject and then comes a list of objects. So we write DBC atmosphere as um, we are used to do it. And then instead of a, uh, a period or instead of a semicolon, we are using a comma. This means now comes another object and then I can write DBC climate change or DBC atmospheric radiation. So comma indicates that subsequent triples have the same subject and the same property. And this is referred to as simply object list. So these are two of the main, let's say, uh, uh, means to abbreviate these triples and make them much more readable. So this is really a nice abbreviation. Okay, we might have a look at literals. So here in that sentence or these uh, triple statements, what we have there is we are looking at carbon dioxide and we see here that carbon dioxide has a sublimation temperature given. It has a molar mass. It has also been discovered. So this was earlier in 1640 and uh, it has a label here. It's carbon dioxide and all of these one, two, three, four uh, triples that you see here, they have as a prop, uh, as an object, they have a value, which means this is a literal. And of course, these literals are associated with types and we have already seen this. So to indicate a specific type, we have this double hat and then comes from the XML schema definition, a specific type. And the nice thing here is again, we can prefix the prefix of the XML schema URL and then it's much easier readable than I have here the prefix XSD in this example. And then I write XSD colon and then double date or whatever this is then. So you see here I can again use the prefix directive to abbreviate um, in the end then the type definition I give here. And also if you want to see how the language tag works, so um, carbon dioxide has the RDFS label here, carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide of course is English. So I give here ampersand EN, which is the abbreviation for that this is given in a natural language, which is English. EN is this ISO conformant to letter abbreviation for um, a country. Okay, that's already much that we know about RDF turtle. Let's have a look at some different problem also related to the notation. What about if I want to indicate so-called multi-valued relations? So look at the red definition I have here that I want to make a statement out of it. So carbon dioxide was discovered or rediscovered by two scientists at different times. Actually, it was discovered by the two guys you see here in the background. You see here on the one hand side, Joseph Black, he is on the left. And you see Jan Baptist van Helmond, Flemish guy on the right side. And of course the Flemish guy, when did he discover carbon dioxide? It was in 1640 and Joseph Black rediscovered carbon dioxide in 1750. However, if I represent it in the way you see here, you have no idea whether 1640 belongs to Jan Baptist van Helmond or to Joseph Black. So if you want to group that somehow to structure it, it's not possible in that way of modeling. By doing that or by solving that kind of problem, blank notes have been introduced. Blank notes are really great for structuring and putting things together. Of course, this is then another kind of modeling. I simply say carbon dioxide has a discovery associated with it. And this discovery splits up in a 
okay, there is a discoverer associated with a discovery and there is a, a date associated with it, which, which is then this uh, discovery date. And by that, of course, I can group together here discoverer and discovery date, which of course comes in very handy because now exactly I can state that Jan Baptist van Helmont discovered carbon dioxide in 1640 and Joseph Black discovered the carbon dioxide then in 1750. Another thing what I can do here is, of course, blank notes can be introduced for resources that don't need a name. So if I want to do an existential uh, statement or something like that, that there is something, I don't know what, which has the following specific properties or the following specific uh, um, uh, attributes. So this is something what I can do with a blank note. Now, how do I serialize these blank notes in Turtle? In Turtle, if the blank note as here, if I look at exactly that part, is a subject, then I simply abbreviate it here with these square brackets that I have here. So anonymous blank note as subject is these square brackets. And then I say, yeah, this blank note has a discoverer and it likewise has a discovered date. Okay, but also we see this is more complex. We have to connect it to another statement and there the blank note, which here is a subject, is an object. How do we do that? Let's have a look at the next slide. So here you see the entire construct and this here is, is really interesting. So let's dive deeper into that and let's have a look here. Okay, so we have carbon dioxide. It's associated with the discovery. So this is the first part you see here. And then we have two times as object a blank note. And since this blank note again is a subject of something else, we start here with indicating, okay, subject blank note, we know this already, this is square brackets. And this is a so-called nested notation of, of anonymous blank note, because we say here what follows here, of course, is the object. And the object likewise is already a subject blank note. So therefore I start here with these square brackets and I write simply the rest of the statement in between the square brackets here. So therefore it's nested. And then I have the discoverer that is also down here, Jan Baptist van Helmont, and I have the discovered date, which is 1640. And since they both have the same subject and the same property, we have a comma. And then comes the next, you know, uh, information here, guided by a blank note here as a subject. So again, I start with my square bracket and then I say here, the discoverer is Joseph Black and it's discovered in 1750. Okay, so this is the way how to do that. Have a closer look already at it because this might become rather complicated if you have here complicated structures where blank notes act as subject as, as well as objects. And to further enhance your confusion, there is a, a special case of blank notes. Blank notes sometimes can also be identified. Then you speak about so-called dereferenceable blank notes. However, they are only then dereferenceable within the same file, within the same knowledge graph. You can't access this from outside. So this is not a URI, this identifier. Of course, it's a URI, but it's not a valid URI uh, accessible from outside. You can only access it from inside. Why you are doing this? Simply to avoid these kind of nested structures. So if you are looking at this here, what we have here, we have two blank notes now indicated in green. And since I want internally refer to these blank notes, I call the first one ID1 and the second one ID2. And to indicate in turtle that these are blank notes, I have here a specific namespace, which is an internal namespace. This is simply an underscore. And then I have ID1 and underscore ID2. And then I can, of course, use them here as an object. And in the next statements, I can use this also as a subject, which then means ID1 here has a discoverer and also has a discovered date. So these are dereferenceable blank notes and they can only be referenced from inside a document or a graph. And sometimes they make these kind of notations a bit more readable again. So this is the purpose of that. Or oh, sometimes you also want to refer to that note at some later point. So therefore it's nice to have inside at least a reference that you can address it and identify it. 
Okay, there is more RDF, but we don't need more in this lecture, in this course. So there are things like, for example, data structures that aggregate single statements, again, for the reason of abbreviation. So data structures for enumeration, any resource or literals. There are so-called open lists, which can be extended, and there are so-called closed lists, which cannot be further extended. So these are so-called RDF containers and RDF collections to put things together. And then to make it easier to make assumptions and statements about a group of things. So this is not new semantics. This is just as one refers it as semantic sugar. This means this is simply, let's say, it, it, um, it makes working with these data structures again a bit easier if you are dealing with containers and collections. On the other hand, if it comes to querying this data, then you have more problems if you are really using containers and collections. If you are interested in that, of course, then read the links, the documentation we gave here, you here, and then you can deepen your knowledge. Another thing, what is also uh, possible in RDF, is to make statements about statements. This is referred to as RDF reification. So if you want to make a statement about a triple, for example, you want to do provenance notation to say who said something, for example, that you can say here, for example, DBpedia states that carbon dioxide has been discovered in 1824. You have the statement carbon dioxide discovered 1824. And now you can make about this statement another statement that, you know, DBpedia said this statement. So for that, you need another construct in RDF. And this is RDF reification, which is also quite simple. And but on the other hand, also makes things uh, uh, parsing the stuff and then applying Sparkle as a as a query language. They are more complicated. However, there are more, more modern approaches for that, like RDF star, but they are not subject here in that course. But you can go deeper into that if you read the documentation and the literature that we have linked here on the slides. OK, this is what you have to know about RDF. About RDF, you can make now statements about things. But what are these things? You know, what we need is a bit more semantics, for example. We want to define a model where we have classes and can define also new properties. And to do that, we need a schema definition language for RDF. And this will be RDFS, which is the RDF schema language. And we will learn about that in the next part of the lecture.